can't. It was to happen after Christmas holiday. And so this affected 33 school districts in Mississippi. And if, if you look at a lot of the schools in Mississippi private schools, check for an, um, uh, an establishment date. And so many of them are about 1969 or 1970. Uh, 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 and it's not just in Mississippi. There were 11 states in the South and probably uh, an estimated 750,000 white children were pulled out of public school and put in these academies. They, the, the, um, the common name for them was academies. Not all were called that, but most were called academies. And they were just sort of instant schools. And um, most of them, it was like sort of buzzwords about immigration, that they were there for a quality education. A few were very blatant about it, that it was strictly all, all white schools, but no sense of equality education, which the definition was, you know, an overnight school without much else except, um, you know, just some, some willing uh, teachers. And, and that most, and interestingly, um, lots of them started in churches for the first year until a tin building could be built somewhere around to house the academy. So um, I was I was one of the students, and uh, um, so many people in uh, my part of Greenwood, Mississippi, were pulled out and put into Pillow Academy. Um, the, the reason the story came about, though, was um, it, it, they'd gone on. There. Some places they closed down pretty soon, fairly soon. That's going to be in route story. Um, but in, in some places, they continued to thrive. And in, in, in my town, they do. And uh, most of them now, since the 90s, have a very small black enrollment. But, and so they will say they're, you know, they, they've moved on from that part of their history. And now they're just all about being an independent school. Um, but it's, it's become so normalized in so many parts of Mississippi. And my project started when Cindy Hyde Smith ran for Senate in 2018 in Mississippi. Uh, Jackson Free Press did an article about she was a graduate of one of these schools. And national media picked up on it. It was, I know, NBC ran a story. And there was a little bit of discussion nationally about this idea. And for so many of us that had graduated from these schools, uh, it just it struck me to think how normalized it had become that, you know, if she was being singled out, how many of us had graduated from schools like this? And so I said, you know, uh, the kind of thing you'll learn, you know, to go to in psychology, the thing that you want to keep a secret is probably the thing you need to talk about. And that applies to cultures too. So I felt like it was time to have this project to talk about this. So many of us that grew up in that time, we were, we were, it, we, it was a big chapter of American history, but we were so young, we didn't see it that way. And now looking back, it, uh, I opened it up in 2019 for stories from academies. I had a number, um, a couple of share the website here. And then um, starting last year, um, I opened it up also to the stories from the public school. I'm so honored to have Paulette and Ralph write uh, stories. And Paulette also has a story, besides being in the public school uh, immigration, she also is part of another part of it that's um, sometimes left out, is how many families just left, like, to not take part of it. She and Margaret McMullen, um, um, a, a white writer on the site, who's written this story about their families just left the state because of it. So that's that's the background on how it starts. Okay, thank you so much. And I know that we started, for those of you watching on YouTube, you kind of joined us when we had already begun. So I just want to take a really quick second to circle back and welcome you to the second um, in our Academy Stories Admissions Projects uh, series. And we're delighted this evening to be joined by Ellen Ann Frentress, who we just heard from, and also another two wonderful writers who were Mississippi born, uh, Paulette Boudreau and Ralph Eubanks. So welcome everybody on YouTube. And, um, I was wondering, uh, Paulette, if you would now sort of tell us a little bit about your um, your story. You know, I've, for those people who haven't had a chance to read it yet, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Um, yeah. So, born and raised, you know, for the most most of my life, really, in in uh, Mississippi, Laurel, and um, I went to segregated schools, so black schools, my whole uh, educational experience up to well. So kindergarten, uh, I went to segregated, a private uh, kindergarten uh, that my parents put me in. And then from um, grades one through six, actually, I, um, well, one through seven in, um, in, Mississi in, in Mississippi, I was in a segregated school, right? And then for two years, 
I, my family sent me to Texas. And so um, part of the reason for going to Texas, Ellen mentioned the voluntary integration. So in my hometown there, the schools, there was voluntary integration and this whole idea that as a black child, I could get a better education in the white schools, but my family was not at all comfortable with sending me to the white side of town. And my grandparents lived in Texas and I had a cousin who was living with them there and they had sent her to voluntary integration to the white school. And they thought it was a safer reality than Mississippi. So I went uh, for eighth grade and ninth grade to, to live with my grandparents in Texas to go to the white school there as, as a, one of the voluntary, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it turned out not to be so great. I can only imagine how difficult it would have been. We always thought of Texas as being more open-minded and more liberal around racial issues um, than Mississippi, and things were pretty tough in the schools for me in Texas, so I can only imagine what it would have been in my hometown there. And so um, at 10th grade, I went back to Mississippi because some things had shifted in my family and went to the, we still had, it was still um, segregated and it was still that voluntary integration. And so I chose to go to the black school, the black high school. And I was there for um, that one year. And that was the 69, 70 crossover year where, you know, the sec desegregation crossover year is what I mean. And so my parents had gotten wind of, I mean, they were keeping up with these issues around desegregation. And, uh, and they knew, you know, they heard all of the news and knew what was happening. And they were concerned about um, what would happen because one of the main um, threats was that the schools would shut down, right? That the black schools would shut down, um, that there would be teacher strike, there would be uh, all kinds of possibilities of, of violence. People were threatening it on both sides of the aisle, right? Um, and my folks were concerned that I wouldn't be able to finish school, right? Graduate and from high school if, if all of these issues were, were true, right? If they came true. Um, so the decision was made to ship, <laughs> ship me first to California because the family could not get everybody. We couldn't all at, in that one um, one moment, pack up and leave because the the uh, at the top of 1970. So in the middle of my 10th grade year is when it was clear. It became real clear because of the law, the the change from the government saying the federal government saying change absolute no no questions now. There's no more dragging your feet about it. So it was not enough time for my family to figure out how to get everybody. Um, I there were. Well, it's sort of a long story, but there were eight of us kids. <laughs> and so to move the whole family was too much in, in that short a time frame. So the decision was made to send me um, out to live with relatives in California, in San Francisco, actually. And then the following year, my, um, my siblings and my mother and so on moved out and joined us. And so I have siblings who had that experience of going to the... Um, mandatory desegregated school system and they had stories to tell because they did put up with a lot of stuff including you know the the people who were lining the streets and all of that to harass the kids who were going because what they did was of course shut down most of the black schools like the black high school was shut down and the black kids were shipped over to the only white high school uh, the only school that was left which was the white high school uh, um, the elementary schools, some of them were consolidated and black kids again were shipped into the white side of town, um, et cetera. And so some of my siblings were in those lines of students, you know, kids walking from one side of town to the other and dealing with the harassment and all of that of um, folks who didn't want them there. And of course, you know, then there's a whole other element <laughs> of what happened in the classroom um, once you are in there. And that's the kind of thing I experienced in Texas where, you know, the kids were not always nice, the teachers were not always nice or polite or considerate or uh, any of those things that a kid needs really when you're trying to get an education, right? So I ended up finishing my last two years of high school uh, in San Francisco and then I went off to college. And um, the general, my general sense of things is that if we had stayed in Mississippi, my story would be a very different story. 
um, than it turned out to be. So mm -hmm. that's all I'll say for now. Um, yeah, and we, I, yeah, that's all I'll say for now. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And Ralph, I'm hoping you can do the same, just as by way of introduction, um, a little bit about your story. Right, I, mean, I, I think that there's so many ways that Paulette's story and my story are parallel. I think I have this story that's more in line with Paulette's siblings of going into the school during mandatory desegregation. It's a very um, strange experience because the black school in my town was closed. Um, it's still closed. There was a gym there that was only two years old, brand new gym, never really used. We now use as a factor. Uh, and we lived under this, we went to school under the same roof, but they kept the classes mm -hmm. Uh I was pulled out as an experiment, probably because I'm white. And they, left, they thought it, that I would be much more accepted in those classrooms. And I think this, the essay that I wrote about is really knowing of the existence of the private school in my town. There's a little, there, and I think Ellen Ann found some digging around that it was probably a council council school, citizens council council school, for those who were the uninitiated. And uh, it existed before, actually, before there was uh, mandatory desegregation, but during that time when there was voluntary integration. So there are people who would not even allow the voluntary integration to take place. And then I kind of moved from that and Begin talking about the experience of every year someone from my class actually you know, there being the empty chair. You knew the people who weren't in there because they had gone on to the academy. Uh, and that was Simpson Academy, which is up the road from my home in Covington County, about I guess about 12 miles up the road. So that's basically my experience every year, someone doing that. And one of them was a very prominent family in town who owned the grocery store in town. My parents would never shop there again. They said, if you, if your kids aren't good enough to go to school with my kids, my money is not good enough to go into your grocery store. And from that day, I never set foot in that grocery store again. Even though my senior year, they started to hire some of my friends to work there. And I think in an effort to try to get black folks in town to bring their money there. If we're going to hire black folks, then you should pay us. And my mother told me, don't you ever set, set foot in there again. And there were people like that. If your family left the school, my parents says, you don't get our money anymore. And that building is still there. And as I you know, wrote in the essay, it has a sign beside it proclaiming that Mount Olive is the home of Steve Air McNair. So it's praising a black football player there, right there, <clears throat> excuse me, by the old segregation academy. I don't think anybody really realizes what that building once was. And it, I, I even mentioned it to several people in my hometown. They had no idea what that, that was once a segregation academy. And it never had a sign. It was all very quiet the way that it was done not like Simpson Academy, which was there. So I guess I was really thinking about the people, the empty chairs, the silence about the existence of the academy in my town, and also the fact that people felt that they they could do that and and still accept black dollars in their stores. Mm -hmm. And my, my parents were not okay with that. My mother said I would drive to Hattiesburg to buy groceries before I would set foot in that grocery store. Well, you know, I you have a part in your essay that I, I'm going to um, just read briefly. Um, you say freedom of choice was a strange phenomena that placed the onus of integration squarely on the backs of black families. It was also a system that assumed people were actually free to choose, one that my mother famously dubbed giving white people the freedom to destroy you. Um, Looking back on it, it reveals the racial dichotomy that exists in this country on how whites and African Americans define freedom. For whites, freedom is something that you possess by birthright and that you fight against when you feel what you have defined as freedom, and that can be defined as almost anything, is being taken away. 
For African Americans, freedom has always been aspirational, something to work toward, but always something conditional that can be taken away at any moment. And that those lines, freedom has always been aspirational, conditional, something that can be taken away at any moment, you know, that pervades is in the air. And I think it shifts and diminishes all of us. We are all harmed and worse off for that. And, you know, I'm, as we're here. And, and I think that's where that, 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 that is where Paulette's story and my story really overlap is that idea of, of freedom. And I think that Paulette's family seeing that freedom as aspirational was thinking, I'm not going to have that. I know that can be taken away. I'm going to go somewhere where that can't be taken away. Um, that wasn't something, I mean, my, when there was discussion about closing schools and that, that discussion came up in my household too, Paula. There was the question, what would we do? And I had an aunt who lived in San Antonio. So again, Texas was an option. The other option was the Pineywood School, which scared the bejesus out of out of us. Oh my God, I hear that place is so strict. <laughs> but that that was so so we had we had options. You know, my family had options, and I think for your family it was like there are eight of you. You're trying to figure out what are the options. Exactly. And, that, and that's and, and that idea of freedom is something that we're always trying to keep. You have to take it away from us, rather yes. than something that we aspire to. Mm -hmm. It's something that we, we possess inherently, right? <laughs> and having to find ways to make it true for ourselves, right? So to make that choice to say, "I have the freedom to say no to this," what you're trying to do to my children, mm -hmm. and I'm going to exercise the freedom that I have to pack up and go somewhere else where things can be better and things can be different for my children and I have more control over that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's, that's it exactly. And I mean I, I mean, I was very lucky that my mother was a teacher. So there was, a, there was, there was some involvement in the school system and it was, so I had someone looking out for me, but I, I think a lot about the people who didn't have that. So I, I was extraordinarily privileged and fortunate. And I'm never, I will never forget that. But I also, um, I know that there are so many people during that time who fell through the cracks. Yes. Um, and, that's, and, and that's the thing that really always troubles me about, about that time. There's, how, how did we, there was an attempt by a lot of teachers, particularly black teachers in that system, to make sure that people didn't fall into the cracks. But there are just, we, we, there are cracks, there were just cracks. They're like huge holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, yes. there was a trap door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All over the place, hidden trap doors. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and one of the really sad, I think, unfortunate things also was that a lot of the teachers, so on the segregated, on my side of town, teacher, principal, all of those folks were black. Most of those folks lost their jobs, right? Because only a handful of those t um, teachers were able to be assimilated into the white school system or because really that's what happened. We, they just got rid of the black school system and you know assimilated everybody into the, the white school system. And so a lot of those teachers, you know, um, when I visited and it took me like 40 something years to go back. So Ralph, I know you went back sooner than that <laughs> once you had moved from the state. I, um, I, I did, I even went to my four-year high school meeting, which my mother was incredulous, but I would do. And I was approached by a friend in town. I was visiting town to are thinking about having a reunion. Would you consider coming? I knew there had been segregated reunions up until that point. And I said, I will only come if everyone is invited. And I remember my friend said, I will make sure that everyone is invited. He found everyone. 
And what we did, and I, my hat is off, is that he even invited the people who had gone to the academy. If you started out with us, you were invited. None of them came. But anyone who was in the ninth grade with us was involved. And there were people who left, who did come back. And I was very, I was very moved by that. It was the first, it was our first real social occasion in 40, really 44 years. Because we've never had a, we've never had a school dance. We had a segregated prom. Everything was still segregated. That was our first integrated gathering of the class. We, you were not, you What's that? School, you had segregated proms? I segregated proms. Wow. Like there were yeah. two proms. There were two proms. Yeah, there were two proms. So, yeah, it's. So, looking back at that time and then thinking about how the, the, that time kind of reverberates into the present is the thing that often gives me pause and uh, when when i hear people saying really horrible things about the public schools in in jackson mississippi i always say y'all made it that way it didn't have to be that way it was so this this is a total creation of the white power structure of jackson that made this happen it's not it's not something oh this is what we all feel Mm -hmm. that we would lose this quality education, that idea of quality education that you talk about, Paula, is kind of the, the way you said it, Eleanor, and this, that was the idea. And no, it was, a, it was, it was, it was almost set up to, for, for these schools to fail. Like we're going to set up our own school system and we're going to slowly sap the resources from the public schools and then we will blame the victim. I have a question for y'all too is that um, I look now, you know, this has been so enlightening, I'm afraid, I'm, I admit to me, as someone who was in a segregation academy, I just assumed if you were in the public school, you were doing the right thing and everybody there was a hero and it was awesome. And then to hear, no, there, it was, you know, it, it was done in bad faith, it was still so white-centered, and I didn't understand that. I wonder now uh, if there's some communities, I think it would be so interesting if some communities would willingly say, you know, we, it was set up to fail before. Let's set it up to succeed this time. Let's try it one more time. I think, I mean, I, many communities would not be interested, but I wonder if there are some communities out there that would. I bet they could be the recipient of all kinds of foundation funds to just like be a model for how would you now go in and try to make this happen? That's actually a really, a very good idea. I think that it would be, I mean, one of the things that, that was done in my hometown was the class of 1970. So those students came in in 1970. So Covington County had Carver High School. There was only one black high school. That became the middle school in college. So we, so every black student in the county went to one high school. So when that happened, you went to school in high school in your hometown in Mount Olive. So those students, there's, if you go down the hall of the school for the class of 1970, even though there are a lot of black folks in that class, there are no black faces in that, that picture. It's like, there's no black faces in the yearbook. It is like a lost class. And the, the school did have an event to honor that lost class and try to find a way to get their pictures up in the school so that you would recognize there was another part of this class because it looks as if the, the class of 1970 was an all white class and it was not. Yeah. 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 That's pretty amazing. I, um, when I did visit uh, Laurel a couple years ago, I checked and the, the only high school, still only one, uh, well, public high school, um, and it's something like 90 something percent is uh, African American and the population of the of the city, of course, of the town doesn't match that at all. <laughs> you know, and of course, all of the, the records and everything for the school don't look very good by way of, of how, um, where they stand in national rankings and all of that. 
uh, or even within the state rankings. So it's still pretty, well, it's it's still very much restrained or I, I, I feel like suffocated, right? And I have I actually have a couple of siblings who moved back to Mississippi. And, um, and one, um, my sister who had children who were still school aid and, and some of the things that she talks about, it's, it's been a mess, right? In terms of how, um, what's happening for the children, even at this stage. Um, yeah. That, so, yes, sorry, I was gonna say that actually leads me to something that I had seen in Paulette, in your essay, um, you talk about the richness of your school experience. So, I mean, I, I wanna continue with like the loss of where, what, the ongoing impacts of segregation, whether that's racial or economic segregation that, that persists today in, in many communities. But I, I thought, so I wanna get there, but I was wondering if we could go back because one of the things in your essay, Paulette, and I'm gonna read a little bit from your essay right now, is to also talk about what was lost, like what was present before. And, you know, you talk about this, you know, incredibly um, rich school experience that you had. And you say, you know, I moved through grade school at Oak Park Elementary and Sandy Gavin Elementary and the first year of Oak Park Junior High in the strong embrace of my segregated black community where education was valued and fostered in a system where everyone looked like me, the other pupils, the teachers, administrators, principals vice principals, the janitors, everyone. Everywhere I turned, I experienced echoes of my mother's sentiments about education. It was the way upward. And, you know, we had um, John James here a, a few weeks ago and talked about her essay collection. And she has the same experience as rich, rich, rich school experience. And as you highlighted here earlier, the the loss of that, the, um, the teachers not being, you know, brought into, um, integrated schools, and I'm <laughs> air quoting that, you know, that they were left um, left behind in the, and so what, how rich it had been and how much was then lost by this, um, the rise of the segregation academy, what our conversation is about here. Can you talk a little bit about that too? Like what your experience was like before? Okay. Um, yes, it's, um, it's night and day, <laughs> night and day, right? Like, um, and as I talked about in my essay, that experience of being, without even realizing it when I was a kid, right? When I was a young kid, that experience of being in a community of people, being in an educational system, being on the same, on the side of town where I lived, where everybody from the bottom all the way to the top, right? Everybody was black. And to be in an educational system like that, where the teachers took for granted, you're an intelligent kid, and if you're not accomplishing, it's because you need to work a little harder, or you need to study more. I need to talk to your parents and let them know so they can get on you to make sure you're doing what you need to. Um, and that was all the way, that was everywhere. That was just, you know, I'm a, a kid, I'm a human kid and I'm living my life and these people care about me and they care about my education. And my job is to live up to these expectations that they have for me. And the difference, of course, when I went to the two years that I was in the predominantly white school in Texas, teachers didn't Many of them, not all of them, some of them did see me as a human being, many of them didn't. And the, there are lots of different consequences to that. Some of the situations <clears throat> were my being um, mistreated in the classroom, right? Disrespected in all kinds of ways by teachers and by students. Um, and it was, it has an impact on the way you think about yourself, the way you experience yourself in the world when these Adults, even though, even though you know, I had family at home telling me, "You're a smart kid. You know, you know what you're doing. Just you know, stiff upper lip kind of thing. You know, kind of suck it up and deal with it, um, and it's going to be okay. You know, etc." Um, but there's still, you know, the sitting in the in the classroom where people are making jokes at your expense, right? The only black kid in the classroom. 
um, or ignoring you or downright telling you, just put your hand down, just be quiet. You know, we don't want to hear from you. Um, this isn't about you and that sort of thing. Um, and it's hard to, to not have that have a personal impact on, your, on, on the person, right? So that it becomes a, a harder job to do my job as a student, <laughs> as a kid who's trying to learn. So in addition to trying to take up the information, I'm also trying to keep my heart from being broken and keep myself from feeling like this big because everybody around me is treating me like I'm this big, right? Um, and you know, in the long end of it or at this other end of it, because I'm an educator and I teach at the community college and I see the black students for the past like 25 to 30 years that I've been teaching at this level. I see the kids who are the result of well, desegregated schools, even out here in California, where they have spent their whole lives, their whole educational lives in the classroom where they were one or two black faces in the room. And they have teachers who don't necessarily value them, don't necessarily believe in their intellect or believe in their abilities to improve or to learn, et cetera. And so they've been not necessarily held to the standard that they need to be or the standard that the white kids in the room were held to, you know? So they arrive out of high school with lesser than skills, right? Because they have not been educated the way they should be. And they have had no experience of being in a classroom with a teacher who looks like them, who um, values them and who lets them know that they're valued, right? I mean, I, every year, <laughs> this year, I had a student say to me, you're the first black teacher I've ever had, right? All the way, <laughs> K through 12, and now we're in college and I'm the first black teacher they've had. Um, and that's, you know, that's in a greater school system, <laughs> public schools, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the damage. That's the damage of integration, ineffective integration, where it's not real integration. It's just on the surface. So we have black kids and white kids sitting in the classrooms together now, but we're not doing anything about actually teaching people what is it to be equal? What is it to t treat someone as if they're equal? What is it to really look at this kid and know that this is a kid, this is a human kid, regardless of the color of the skin? And so there's always human potential there, right? And so to treat them like that, there is human potential. What can I do to help you realize your potential? But it's, no, that's not how it happens. That's not how it happens. So. Well, I think, you know, and going back to the, the, the present day, you have the implications, you know, and, and you were talking about Jackson, um, Ralph, you know, talked about, you know, that this is, these are, you know, created that this is the, the, the school systems that are in trouble were created by um, white parents removing their children from schools. And, and that's kind of where I wanted to get to then is like, there are, you know, there's present day implications for all of us, all the, the, the nation, every student, every parent, every community, every government system in the nation is impacted um, and negatively impacted by inequitable segregated schools. And, you know, Ralph, in your essay, you talked a bit of, um, I, I'm going to misquote you. I don't have the exact quote, but that you sort of have these second generation segregation academies, which would maybe were Christian schools. And I think that those continue. And I see with also, and I mentioned earlier, some economic segregation. And that I think the parents, and Ellen Anna's talked about this, you know, at our previous event, that that maybe the parents who make these decisions for their kids may feel like they are doing it to give their children the best education. That that is the, that is the, the words that they use. And it even may be the thoughts that they have, like not in anyone's head or heart. Um, but the the implications of that for the whole community continue to really reverberate and, and be profound. And so I'm really wondering how do we, um, how do we go from here? Like, how do we, what? 
I mean, you know, I, I, I wish I knew the answer exactly where we go from here because we have there are several things that, that happen. I think that, that Paula really, I think, brings brings up that those those teachers that you had in those black schools, you had a lot of a lot of people with a lot of education because that they didn't have anywhere else to go but to teach. So, you know, a lot of black students went to schools where they had people with advanced degrees. Those people got pushed to the side. I think I, I, Malcolm Gladwell talked about this on one of his revisions history podcasts. I think there's, oh, since, not, since the Brown decision, I think there's been a 40% decrease in the number of black teachers. And that once the Brown decision came in, the number of black teachers just it's just it's just gone down steadily and somehow we have to we have to begin to value public education again and we haven't i mean i think we pay a lot of lip service to valuing public education but the but also the bureaucratic systems around it that have, that have come about post-integration haven't allowed, except in a very, very few places, and usually places that are incredibly affluent, is where it has worked. And it is, we need to stop thinking about education as something for the affluent, rather than something that is for everyone. And I think that's that may be, I think the, the dirty little secret of all of this is how much race sometimes is um, also viewed, conflated with class. And that keeps, so but if you conflate race and class, it's like these are not the middle schools, but then these other schools that are largely white, those are viewed as the better schools. Somehow we have to acknowledge but that is the way we are, that we've conflated these two things. Mm -hmm. You're shaking your head all in, in agreement. And that is, that's, I think that's the issue, that, that conflation of racism. Mm -hmm. yes. And until we, until we come to terms with that, we're mm -hmm. going to be, keep, we're going to continue to go through this cycle. Now, yes. I wonder for, uh, for white students, uh, to be around it's not a quality education if you're never around anyone but other white people. Yeah, and, and there's there's yeah. still generations going on like that. Um, it's and it's just and, it's and I, all of society. I actually think it would be helpful within the schools to understand this history. That that understanding this your school is in this situation because of what happened. You know, with a court decision that happened in 1969, you know, 50 years ago, is something that happened 50 years ago is having an impact on your education. We don't want students to, we don't want young people to know these things. We keep those things silent. That, that and then when I, when, I, when I get them in you know, my Southern Studies class at the University of Mississippi, and I tell them this history, they are furious. Nobody's told them this before. They, both black and white students, they are furious that no one's told them this before. And then I just think someone has, it, it's slowly over the years we've told them that rather than this, this very ascendant civil rights narrative that we like to tell, that we like to teach. If we also say there are a lot of bumps in the road, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, as I always say all the time, I, I, one of my students was listening. They're, they know what's they know what's coming next. It is not a linear narrative; it's a layered narrative, and we have to look at all the different layers mm -hmm. of that story in order to understand it. And that's and I don't think we're willing to do that, or I should say, the school system is not willing to do that. I would say, even at the University of Mississippi, we are not completely willing to talk about our whole history. We like to keep that ascendant narrative going as well. I always say that the Meredith statue on campus with that sign of opportunity there saying, you know, he went through that door and everything changed and everything happened. And they ignore the fact that in 1970, they jailed 84 black students there for protesting. 
um, you know, that they didn't have a black studies program, that there were no black professors. So, that, so we have to understand all of those different layers of our history rather than this ascendant narrative that we'd like to. The academies, so many of them um, uh, observed their 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. And um, I'm not aware of any one that ever admitted to why they were founded. Um, I know in the Greenwood paper, they did a 36 page um, special supplement to the Greenwood Commonwealth the Hill Academy's 50th anniversary. And there was a single sentence that said at some point that parents of both races were concerned about the federal court case at the time. And that was it. Um, yeah, and I've talked to people there. Uh, I've talked to teachers that said, you know, I've kind of vaguely heard that might have been something involved in it, but I wasn't sure. And, you know, so, and so to, to me, are, are you in good faith if you're not even talking about your own founding? Is it a quality education and you're okay because now there's a, you know, a small black enrollment if you're still not talking about it? And yeah, this is just what, what the country needs to do is, this is to me, always Mississippi is always writ large. I know I'm thinking of the choir here. Everybody. Uh, it's America writ large, and we've got to talk about these things to be a healthy, to be a healthy society. If we're not talking about them, we're not healthy. Yeah, I have the sense. I mean, I said the, had the occasion to say this to some friends a few years ago. <laughs> we live in a big Mississippi, right? I mean, America, and. <laughs> Uh, and there are various ways that we turn away from that or we try to deny that and so on, you know, and here I am in California where, I, and I, I have had the experience of it being most liberal of places that I've lived in the U.S. And I've lived on the East Coast, <clears throat> I lived in upstate, you know, New York and so on and, and uh, Boston and various places. <clears throat> and I, it still, you know, California strikes me as being more open-minded and more diverse in a lot of ways. Um, but here in California, we are just now getting to ethnic studies programs and courses and so on at the college level. And now, so this kind of um, addresses, Kyla, your question about what do we do? You know, how do we change or, you know, fix some of these issues? And one of them has to do with, so at this top level of people who are getting a college education, these are the folks who are going to be going into teaching cl in classrooms and working in these various areas that impact how the future goes for the whole of the country, right? And, um, and these, what was it, back in, I think it was 1967, San Francisco State University um, students were trying to get black studies programs right and this state has just now <laughs> finally passed legislation that says you must develop ethnic studies programs ethnic studies courses etc 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 and one of the things that, and of course there's you know there's resistance in, in certain corners um, but one of the things that is a tremendous value there is that people who are coming into colleges in the future will get experience of presumably black history, black that is not like necessarily parceled out or pulled out of the regu regular American history or regular American literature and all of that. But it all gets in, in a real sense, it gets integrated education that includes like this piece is part of the Black American experience, but it's really all of America's experience, right? So everybody starts to get that history, these things that, so when students show up, you know, they're not surprised by this history that no one has bothered to tell them or that people have deliberately worked really hard to keep from them, right? So that's one of the places where we start too, is to, create an educational reality where people get the whole story and not just mm -hmm. part of the story. And then we learn how to work with each other with the whole story and not just the pieces, right? So. I'm just gonna say if anybody uh, out there watching has any questions, now is a great um, time. You can type them into the chat, whether you're watching on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, and our friend Steve from the library will be monitoring that and trying to make sure that we get to them. So please type in any questions that you have. Um, I was hoping that we could talk a little bit, we were talking you know, um, behind the scenes a little bit about um, 
Prince Edward County, Virginia. And, you know, how much that impacted, you know, your parents in Mississippi, you know, maybe some concerns about what might happen. And I was wondering if, if, if one of you and one of the three of you would like to just give the audience a little bit like what happened in Prince Edward County, Virginia, and, and what are the implications of that? Um, well, I think Paula and I are both aware of it. I mean, our parents are clearly aware of it, but I think the schools were closed for five years. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know you're doing an event with, with Ken Woodley coming up, and you know, Ken writes about that in his in his book about you know, the newspaper being complicit with that. So you had the media complicit with it, you had the whole school system. And the, you know, Virginia has offered the only kind of reparations, civil rights era reparations, and and the nation, so anyone who was part of that school system that was locked out of it, who didn't get an education, can get money from the state to compete for it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that what poets, parents, and my parents were concerned with was that we would not be able to complete our education. Exactly. Um, and that's it. Because it happened, because they knew that it happened somewhere. They, yes, and they were very much concerned about it. That was part of the conversation that uh, my parents were having. Yes, that whole idea that in this other place, you know, they shut down the schools, and if they do that here, you know, and the black kids were the ones who were left without a place to go. And so, yeah, it was a real, a, a real, it was a, a, a motivating factor, really. Um, and and my, think, the oh, was if it happened in Genesee, Virginia, it would surely happen in this city. Right, exactly. exactly. And I think that's that's one of those decisions that are made that hurt everybody. You right. know, it just it hurts everybody for generations. And I think as we're th you know as we're talking, and I asked the question, okay, what how do we go forward thinking? And I think what would happen if, if we made decisions about how we are interacting with other people, including where we are educating our children, mm -hmm. that we. Um, Think about it from, you know, what do I want the world to look like for my grandchildren, my grandchildren's grandchildren, and how are this, the decisions I'm making today in terms of relationship and community, how are those, how is that building that world that I want to have? Mm -hmm. And I think as the decisions we think about segregation academies does, does not seem like maybe that was fully thought through. Yeah. You know, and I feel like well, um, with the segregation academy, that uh, oh, we're talking about where do we go forward with the schools. Another way to do it is approach it from an economics. Uh, I would like to, I would love to see some economic story studies about the towns that still have the thriving um, segregation academies that is basically back to a pre Brown um, system where the white children are in the academy with a, a very minimal minority in the enrollment and the public schools are nearly 100% black. Um, those those towns, um, how are they how are they thriving now compared to towns with viable public school systems that are supported you know, community wide? I feel like the, the people I, I've said before. I think Greenwood. Um, I look at it. I think the people that founded the segregation academy that they would have thought at that point with the court decision coming and the, um, what's about to happen, they would have air quoted solved their problem. But did they sort of uh, sign a death warrant for their town three generations later? Because why go to a town like that when you can go to a town with a, you know, with a thriving public school system? Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I know Laurel's uh, population has dropped dramatically in the years since my family left and so on. That, um, And I, I think some of it is the county, people moving out to send their kids to county schools as they, you know, as they're named, but um, yeah, there's been a dramatic exodus, right? <laughs> Which is never good for a community, you know? So we do have a couple of questions. We had one that popped up from uh, our friend Brandy uh, in Mississippi, hi Brandy in Mississippi, um, who's asking about um, Piney Woods School. Oh. <laughs> well, Piney Woods School is a, it is a private, um, Black boarding school yeah. in um, just, in, I guess it's actually in Lincoln County, south of Jackson. Um, and it's called Pinewood's Country Life School. Not only did you go to school there, but you work the farm. You live, and, but yeah. You, 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 you live the life. Now, I grew up on a farm, so it's like, I was used to the farm work. It was like, but, but I, I heard it was really, 
very, very strict. And so yes. that was the, yeah. that was the thing that we were really oh my goodness, we yes. really have to go into the video. And the fact that my, my, my family, family could even take things about paying for fun. Yeah, my family easy. sent one of my uncles there who was who was he was just a few years older than me and that was the solution for getting him finishing his education because he was getting involved in all sorts of things including the civil rights movement and part of the thing that they did was to um, enroll him in Piney Woods <laughs> and he managed yeah. to make it for a few years and it was he talked about how tough it was because they did work them hard and they had really strict rules and all of that. But it was a good um, discipline, right? To a certain extent, yeah. you know, to really create a, an individual who could function well, a black individual, black young man um, who would function well and pre presumably, you know, do go on and do great things. But <laughs> but yeah, he, he had your <laughs> he had your thought about it too. That though, that sounds like a tough life. <laughs> no, <laughs> indeed, it was. <laughs> And Paula, also somebody has asked for some clarification from your comment. Um, just wondering about California. Um, are you saying that California did not have ethnic study programs before now, despite various black studies programs purported to have been taught there during the 1960s? Um, there are um, there are some schools do have them, right? Um, and there's you can kind of imagine that in com certain communities there's there's more more of a likelihood, right? So. Um, a community like Oakland, uh, California, where you have a large black population and the schools there are meaning, um, I'm talking about the college system at this point, um, those schools would have more black faculty, they would have more black students and so on. And so they would have and they do have um, programs there. And, uh, and some, of the, some of the schools do have different um, types of programs, but this was a legislation to man require it. So every college, so um, for example, students coming out of the college where I teach, and they're, if they're transferring into one of the, the CSUs, California State University, they will now be required to take at least one ethnic studies course. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of schools don't have ethnic studies courses and a lot of schools like my school does not have a black studies or an ethnic studies department. But now we will have to have some ethnic studies courses to, for our students to take so that when they transfer, they will have met that requirement. And so it is now part of the, you know, well, it's a, it's a mandatory thing that students now take as part of their education, higher education, is that they take a, at least one <laughs> studies course. So, you know, and it'll be, and it can, well, they're, they have different rules and parameters and so on about which ethnic groups that the courses need to focus on. And it's four major ethnic groups in the U.S., right? African-American, um, Native Americans, um, Latino, Latinx, um, and um, Asian Americans. So that it's the idea is to um, make sure that everybody has a, a, a taste of the complete education, mm -hmm. <laughs> the completeness of America. Here's what it is. And so I know something about how to, what the issues are that people who, don't necessarily look like me. I know something about the issues they face. I know something about their efforts to deal with those issues. And I know something about how to become part of that conversation to deal with those issues as well. And those are part of the some of the parameters for these new ethnic studies courses. And I think that echoes what we've sort of, there's been a thread throughout, which is the loss for um, white students. Mm -hmm. it, you know, well, any student to to only live in in the, the bu in a bubble, yes. and when there's so much richness and vibrancy, and points of view and experiences to be gained by having having a wider um, education, wider friend group, wider everything. I mean, we're only made richer for that. And I think the stories that you share about you know your experiences and and as we talk about and and the, the long-term impacts on communities from these kinds of decisions, I mean, it's just, it's heartbreaking, but also it seems hopeful because we don't have, we can make different decisions. You know? yes. one, thing, one thing I'd like to say is that, you know, the, the academy system in Mississippi and in the South, it's, it's certainly a worthy target for really examining 
But I hope this project doesn't end up just only to be seen as a jumping on the academy system in the South, because I would like this project to be a template for any community anywhere to, to look and examine their system of education and where does, where does racism and white supremacy impact the education system where they were and to share, and for everybody to share stories. I would love to see um, other projects in other places. And I'm so glad you said that earlier, because I think that that idea of white supremacy being a part of the entire education system, that we like to ascribe it to the South or particularly to the English, but it works, it is part of the entire education system. Yes. So, I'm, unfortunately, I do, we are, we're at that time where we have to, um, unfortunately, close the discussion for now, but I hope to have all of you back, and I'm sure that we will, um, to talk whether about this or other things, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, I do want to thank everybody for being here. For those of you at home, if you want to learn more about the admissions projects or Academy Stories, Steve has been very kindly putting in links in the chats. Hopefully you can find them. Um, you can visit admissionsprojects.com. And um, also Ralph and Paulette have amazing books for you to read. If you'd like to learn more about them, you can read Paulette's novel, Mulberry. And I have it on good authority that there may be something else coming along for you at some point soon. But so go to your go to your favorite independent bookstore or your favorite library and get this. And um, Ralph has this brand new book out that's absolutely gorgeous and beautiful called A Place Like Mississippi. And you can get that or some of his other books by, again, going to your favorite bookstore or going to the library. And our friends, PGC MLS, will hook you up with a virtual library card, even if you don't live in Prince George's County. Um, and um, we have many, many, many great events coming up. I would like to give you a little bit of a highlight about what we have um, coming. Next Tuesday, our ongoing diversity dialogue continues when I get together with Michelle from the library. And we're going to talk about the miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. That is on Tuesday. On Thursday, please join us at four o'clock as we have an important community conversation about how to respond to anti-Asian bias and hate incidents. We also invite you to join us for some upcoming events. We're talking to poet Jacqueline Trimble on um, May 3rd about her amazing collection, American Happiness. And on May 4th, our Democracy in Action series continues. We are going to talk to Steve Pfiffer, the co-author of this uh, wonderful memoir by C.T. Vivian about C.T. Vivian's um, life in action. And relevant to this discussion on May 17th, uh, the 67th anniversary of Brown versus Board, we are talking to Steve Suits about his book, Overturning Brown. We have lots, 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 lots more events um, between us and the library. So you can check those out by going to our events page, which is tinyurl.com slash PGCHRC events. And I'm hoping Steve has that and can put it up. And uh, you can also go to the library's events page at pgcmls.info slash events and see what they have going on. So, wow, that's a lot of closing remarks. Thank you, everyone, for being here, Steve, behind the scenes, and, of course, Ellen, Ann, Paulette, and Ralph, thank you so much for your time, your insight, your words, and just, to, you know, having the energy to be with us tonight. I really appreciate all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure being with you, and I hope to see you again in person sometime, Paulette. Right. <laughs> yes, yes. And thank you very much, Kyla, for organizing this and arranging to bring us all together. It's been a good conversation, everyone. Yes. You're